This is an introduction to Green's theorem that relates the value of a line integral around a simple closed curve to the area that's enclosed by that curve. And additionally, it gives us a nice shortcut for evaluating a line integral. In order for Green's theorem to be applicable, though, we do have several criteria that need to be met. The path C for the line integral has to be positively oriented, simple, closed, and piecewise smooth. So let's consider some arbitrary path C, and we'll say that it's simple because the path does not ever cross itself. Our path is closed because the initial point is equal to the terminal point, meaning that if we started at a point P0 and we end up at the same point where we started, that means our curve is closed. Our path is also positively oriented, which means that we are traveling counterclockwise around the outside of the path. So when all those things are true about our path C, then we're allowed to use Green's theorem in order to calculate the line integral over that path. Now let's let f, x, y be some vector field that's passing through this region. And these vectors can be facing in all different directions with varying magnitudes. And let's also let d be this region inside C, or we'll call it the interior of C. One notation that we're quite familiar with on how to evaluate a line integral is f dot dr. The differential notation for calculating this line integral is p dx plus q dy. But both of these versions of the line integral require us to parameterize the curve C and then use those parametric equations to come up with substitutions for the quantities in these integrands and then write the entire integral to depend on t, that parameter. What Green's theorem says is that this line integral can be evaluated by looking at a double integral over d, the interior of c, where the integrand is the scalar function, partial derivative of our q component of the vector function with respect to y, minus partial derivative of our p component of that vector function with respect to x. So these two scalar functions are then subtracted, and we calculate the double integral of this scalar function over d, and then we choose the dA that serves us best depending on the shape of that region. And this can often be quite the shortcut because it enables us to skip the step of having to parameterize the path c. So let's look at a quick example. We're asked to use Green's theorem to evaluate this line integral. This line integral is expressed in differential form. It could also be expressed in our f dot dr form. But when it's expressed in the differential form, we can see that this expression here is our p-scalar function. That's the horizontal component of the vector field. And this expression here is our q-scalar function that is the vertical component of our vector field. So from this differential form, we can see that the vector field can be extracted from that integrand where y e to the negative x is the p component and 1 half x squared minus e to the negative x is the q component. Now remember Green's theorem has a lot of criteria that need to be met about the path c. It needs to be simple, closed, and positively oriented. In this example, we're given the parametric equations for the path c, and we recognize this as being the unit circle. When t is equal to 0, we're at the ordered pair 1, 0. And when t is equal to pi over 2, we're at the ordered pair 0, 1. And we can see now that we are indeed positively oriented, and a simple enclosed curve. So we can proceed with Green's theorem, which again says the line integral can be evaluated by looking at a double integral over the interior of C, which, as a reminder, is the region enclosed by C of the integrand partial of Q with respect to X minus partial of P with respect to Y, and then we continue to say dA here until we decide on our limits of integration. So first thing that we need to do is to determine these first partial derivatives of P and of Q. Remember, this is P and this is Q. So the first partial of Q with respect to X is going to be X to the first power plus E to the negative X. And the first partial of P with respect to Y is going to be just E to the negative X. So we take these two values and we then build our double integral. We still haven't decided on our limits of integration, so we'll just say over the domain d. Partial q respect x is x plus e to the negative x minus partial p respect y is e to the negative x. So we just subtract e to the negative x here. 
we're still just saying da for now, and we see that the integrand collapses quite nicely to being just x. So our line integral is turning into something pretty manageable, x da, and it's time to decide on our limits of integration. So we've turned this line integral over a vector field into a double integral of a scalar function, which we've done many times before. And since the domain region D that we're integrating over is a circle, it would be easier to use cylindrical coordinates to evaluate this integral. To convert this rectangular integrand into cylindrical coordinates, we'll substitute our cos theta for the x, and our dA quantity requires us to pick up a factor of r, and then it looks like dr d theta is a perfectly fine order to choose. Envisioning the tiny polar rectangle in our domain region, we could integrate with respect to r first, and r goes from 0 to 1, and then we sweep this all the way around to say that the value of theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And now we're evaluating a pretty straightforward double integral with constant limits of integration. The first iteration is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of r squared cos theta dr. So cos theta is a constant multiple, and the antiderivative of r squared is r cubed over 3. And then when we evaluate this from 0 to 1, we get 1 third cos theta, which then becomes the integrand in our second iteration which is the integral from 0 to 2 pi. I'll pull the 1 third out to the outside, and our integrand is cos theta evaluated with respect to theta. So we then have 1 third times the antiderivative of cosine is sine. And when we plug in our limits of integration, we end up with the value 0. So to summarize, this line integral did turn out to be 0. However, the vector field was not conservative. Remember, the test for determining whether or not a vector function is conservative is to look at the first partial of p with respect to y and see whether or not that's equal to the first partial of q with respect to x. And if this is true, then we would say, yes, the vector field is conservative, and we can guarantee that f dot dr will be 0 for all paths c. We've shown that that line integral was zero for one particular path, but it's not conservative, which means that it might not be zero for all paths. If we apply Green's theorem to a conservative vector field, where these two quantities are equal to each other, then that double integral over the interior of C is going to have an integrand that cancels out to being zero. So if these two are equal to each other, we get zero no matter what path it is. Now again, in our example, we did end up with a line integral that equaled to zero, but that was not because it was a conservative vector field. We did not get zero as an integrand. And this suggests that if we had chosen a different path, C, that was also closed, we may well get a non-zero quantity for that line integral.